And so for you to manifest, you have to build up, build up in prayer. Because there is a place you pray to where there are coals of fire. That's where your tongue will be touched. And if your tongue is taught, it will be purged. When you come back, you can become a prophet. Jesus, Father, we bless your name, we magnify your name, we exalt you, we love you, we honor you. We ask that tonight you open us up to your oracles and pour of your spirit upon us. Grant us access to dimensions eternal and empower us even for the work of the kingdom in the last days. Take all the praise, take all the glory. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. Tonight, I want to share something very important. Important because, number one, without it, we cannot do the business of the kingdom. And number two, important because there is a caution that we need to draw our attention to because the devil is outrightly attacking this operation of the spirit. And if we don't pay attention to it, a generation will be robbed of inheritance, a generation will be, be robbed of authority and power to advancing the kingdom of God. This is the gathering of eagles, and we are not eagles except as we are enabled. We are not eagles except as we are empowered. And so tonight, I want to talk to us about the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And trusting the Lord because of the delicate emphasis I want to bring to help me remain calm for a long period of time to explain some of these things. People are excited, people are shouting, people are being slain, but the manifestations, attendant manifestations of the anointing that we saw in scriptures and that we saw in the life of the fathers of old, is gradually seeping out of our experience and of our gathering. And if we don't pay attention to these things and examine them carefully, a time we come, we will only be excited, we will only be psychological, but the things that the anointings do, we will no longer find them in our midst. This is why this subject is very important, and this is why I want to advance it from the perspective from which I'm advancing it tonight. Praise the Lord. We are becoming naked people, trying to cover up for our nakedness with a lot of psychology and a lot of emotions. That will not suffice. So long as the blind is not seeing, the deaf is not hearing, the lame is not walking, the power of the Holy Ghost is not pushing the tides of darkness backward, everything we are doing is religion. And for us to make demand on the same dimension of the anointings, that the fathers of old handled. They are setting coordinates of scriptures we must pay attention to. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 12, Paul said, I demonstrated before you all the signs of an apostle. Every man who is sent, there are signs, there are emphasis. In Mark 16, verse 20, the Bible said they went out and the Lord walking with them, confirming the word with signs and wonders following. In Acts 14, verse 3, it said, Long time abode day, speaking boldly in the Lord. The Lord confirming the words of His grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. In Acts chapter 4, verse 29, it said, When they were gathered together, the place where they were was shaken. And it said, They were filled again with the Holy Spirit. And it said, The Lord stretched forth His hands, walking among them signs and wonders. And he said, great grace was upon them. These guys were not psychological people. These guys were not emotional people. There were signs that were verifiable. There were wonders that drew the attention of people to the Lord Jesus. And if the gospel must be preached accurately in our day and time, then the subject of the anointing must be understood. Not from an emotional perspective, but from an accurate scriptural context. You don't have to be excited for the anointing to walk. You don't have to be in church, in a conference for the anointing to move. In the days of the apostles of old, the wonders they wrought were in marketplaces. The wonders they wrought were in territories where they were criticized. The wonders they wrought was without keyboards. The wonders they wrought were in dark 
territories and the testimony of their ministries were backed up with impossible things that God did through them. In fact, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 from verse 1, he said, when I came unto you, I did not come with excellency of speech, declaring unto you the testimony of God. He said, I came with the demonstration of the spirit and power that your faith may not be built in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Our generation is gradually replacing the tangible power of the Holy Spirit with psychology and with emotion. And because most of our gatherings are filled with young people who are excited, we confuse ourselves to think it's the power of God. When you become 50, you will wake up. Adrenaline and hormones will go down. You will understand that the gospel is not a trick. It's a reality that was handled by the first fathers. And if you don't handle it, you don't have it. And when that time comes, if you don't have it, darkness will make a mess of you. This is why we need to re-examine the scripture to find out the tenets of the anointing. And begin to commit ourselves to it as quick as possible. Because if there is any time we need the power of the Holy Spirit, that time is now. Tonight, I want to shut down emotions and get us facts of scriptures. Most times when I come for meetings, the intensity is so much that we can't even share God's word. There are three things I'll be advancing tonight on the subject of receiving the anointing. Because that's what I want to talk about tonight. Thank you so much. God bless you. You can sit down. Celebrate them. And so the three things I'll talk about is number one, who anoints men? Number two, what is the anointing meant for? And then number three, how do you receive the anointing? Please pay attention. Please, I beg you. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is most graphically defined in Acts chapter 10 verse 38. The Bible said how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with, with, he gave us the substance of the anointing. When we say the anointing, what is it made up of? So he said God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. So the anointing is made up of two things. Number one is the person of the Holy Spirit. And number two is the attributes of the Holy Spirit. In that scripture, he picked power. But there are many attributes of the Holy Spirit. This is why the anointing is not just a force. The anointing is first of all a person. And the force, the life force that comes out of that person. The anointing is the person of the Holy Spirit and the attributes of the Holy Spirit. He said God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. With the Holy Ghost and with power. In the Old Testament, men who were anointed, the Holy Ghost came upon them. And the fragrances of his attributes flowed through them. In the New Testament, however, the Holy Ghost does not just come upon us. The Holy Ghost, first of all, came within us and then he comes upon us. But over and above the operation of the Holy Spirit, it's important for you to know that he is the person and the attributes. It could be power, it could be wisdom, it could be favor, whatever attribute that flows through you per time. Is part of the component of the anointing. It's important for you to understand this definition so you will know who anoints men. 
If you don't understand this definition, you will mistake the person of the anointing for a teen. And because you mistake the person of the anointing for a teen, you will misunderstand who actually anoints men. And if you don't know who anoints men, you will do a lot of crazy things. Thinking you'll be anointed in the process, you may meet a teen one. A lot of people have done things and they collided with demons and their lives were wrecked. And they didn't know why it happened that way. It's because they didn't know what the anointing was about. And so the anointing is the person of the Holy Spirit and the attributes of the Holy Spirit. Now, having understood this, who has the power to impart the Holy Spirit? You now discover only one person anoints. And the one who anoints is God. It's God that anoints men. In this same scripture, you see what the Bible said. It said, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Only God anoints men. If you study Numbers chapter 17 verse 11, Moses was counseled by his father-in-law to get elders who will support him in bearing the bodies that he bore daily. And God came to corroborate it. But God made us understand that bearing the burdens of God is not just a mental thing. There are many people today who have studied and they think because of their mental power, they can bear the burdens of God. There are many people today who have seen problems in the body of Christ. And because they are educated and can speak English, they want to bear spiritual burdens by mental power. And then you'll find them sitting everywhere trying to correct the body of Christ. Try to teach the body of Christ what to do because they can gather facts and analyze it. Without the help of the Holy Spirit, it's impossible to do a spiritual business. And so even after Jethro counseled Moses, it would not work that way. When God showed up, God said in Numbers 17 verse 11, He said, ordain 70 elders. He said, I will take of the spirit that is upon you and place upon them. Two things you find in that scripture is number one, you cannot help God carry out the business of God with your mental power. No matter how intelligent you are, no matter how burdened you are, no matter the facts you gather, you don't have the competence to do a spiritual business with mental power. Your prowess means nothing when spirits are involved. You may start where Wait until a demon intercepts you. You will discover how weak and vulnerable you are. That same thing you are advancing, a point will come. You will become the architect that fight it. You will not know. A lot of people stand up. They try to accuse men that they are immoral. Pastors are immoral. Elders are immoral. After a few weeks, a demon gives them influence. The same immorality they are fighting, they begin to do it. Many come and accuse pastors that they are swindling money from people. And because they are, they are attacking spiritual men, people support them, clap hands for them. After one year, a point comes, that business becomes a business of swindling. And they don't know how they got there. Mental power is not sufficient in carrying out spiritual business. And so even though the counsel of Jethro was correct, God didn't endorse it. What God did was to do it by the spirit. And the second thing you see from that scripture is that a man can anoint a man. The spirit was upon Moses. But God said, I will be the one to take that spirit and put upon the elders. This is why a man who lays hands on somebody and he becomes anointed will be praying to God about his son for 10 years. Nothing happens. If he had his way, he would have laid that same hands on his son and nothing will happen. You will find a man who will have 200 pastors. Two of them are picked of God and are being used. And the other 198, no matter what he does, they are not anointed. It is therefore futility to show up as a man and boast that you made somebody. No man can make another man. Only God makes men. Because if you claim you make men, you should be able to make everybody under you. How come it's one and two or three people only who are made? It means that is fallacy. You don't even know what you are talking about. Only God makes men. He said, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. He said, let us make man in our own image. Only God 
met men. So it's God who anoints. Even though the grace is upon you. If God doesn't take that grace and put on another. Forget about it. You cannot make any difference about it. If you understand that only God anoints men. When you begin the journey of the anointing. You will not trace a man. You will find God. If you know that it's only God who makes men. When you start seeking the anointing. You will not compromise the standards of God. You will keep the standards of God. Because if you violate it, you have already exonerated yourself from the process. This is why the sorcerer came to Peter to give him money. And say, give me this power that you have. He said, your money perish with you. To think you can buy the gift of God with money. If you violate the standard of God, you have already compromised the process. You can never be anointed. Please sit down. You run! You run! You run! You run! Kadosh! You are mighty on your throne. You run! You run! Kadosh! You are mighty on your throne. God is the only one who anoints men. However, they are mediums. You know, when you say things like this, people get excited. Because when they hear you say things like this, they now want to begin to attack men. They think you are pitching your tent against other men of God. They don't know it's the spirit of the Antichrist. I'm taking time to follow this route. To help somebody because we are in the media generation. You will go and find gullible things on the internet. It will rob you. It will rob you. It will rob you. See, many genuine people can't make progress because they hurt the wrong people. Men who are not custodians. What they wanting to correct and talk to the body of Christ because they have fast. Listen, if somebody is wrong, condemn him for his error. But don't try to talk about eternal principles. These are landmarks. You don't know what they contain. You don't know them. If a man sins, say he has sinned. But don't drag that man into the principles of the kingdom. You don't know it. You don't know it. Only God anoints men. But there are mediums. And I'll talk about two mediums that God uses when he anoints men. Number one is through encounters. When God genuinely wants to anoint a man, he will encounter that man. Read the scriptures, it is replete. In Exodus chapter 3, Moses had a body to deliver Israel. Great body. In fact, he went as far as killing an Egyptian. But he didn't give him the power required. Until God encountered him at the backside of the desert. Even in Horeb, the mountain of God. And suddenly, Moses returned. The rod of Moses became the rod of God. When a man encounters God, something rubs off on him. It is natural. Because God comes with an energy. God comes with an atmosphere. If he meets you, when you leave, there will be a signature. And the more you meet God, the stronger the grace on your life becomes. Because the Moses who met God on Horeb didn't just meet him once. In Exodus 33 verse 29 and 30, Moses came down from Sinai. And the Bible said the face of Moses was shining. The oil was becoming thicker. So the more a man encounters God, the more anointed he becomes. And you can encounter God through an open vision. You can encounter God through his word. You can encounter God through the transmissions of the spirit of of God. God can choose to carry you to a place in the spirit. And different things can happen. But whichever way, you are not anointed until you have encountered God. If you have not encountered God, you try your spirit. Or check the potency of what you say you carry. Don't just pray for people in church. Go to the market. And pray for people too. And when you pray, find out the testimonies that come from it. You will discover that you may come to a place people respond because they have been taught the cliche. That's why in our generation today, people fall under the power only in church. How many times have you seen people fall under the power in the market? How many times have you changed geographical location? And you found people falling under the power. People fall under the power in Nigeria. Go and try it in UK. Because they don't have that orientation. 
And so the anointing is beyond an emotional expression. The anointing has to be tangible. It has to lead to transformation and it has to lead to tangible change that can be verified. Certain other things are variables. If you have not encountered God, you can't be sure that you have been anointed. And if you think you are, what you do in Enugu, be able to do it in Kano. Be able to do it in Meduguri. Be able to do it in Afghanistan. Be able to do it in United Kingdom. Be able to do it in Ghana. If you can't replicate it in different places, you are just working with people who have been psychologically brainwashed. That's not an anointing. But if you truly encounter God, what you carry will defy territory. Anywhere you go, you will replicate it in higher intensity. It will not be regulated by territory. I'm not talking about a situation of unbelief. When people walk in unbelief, they can stiffen the anointing. But I'm talking about a situation where the people have heard the gospel, their heart is open. But because they are not oriented in a certain way, they can't replicate the dimension. If you find such things, know that what they are dealing with is a fallacy. This is why our generation must encounter God. Because God wants to send men. What you are doing in Enugu will not end in Enugu. God needs a man in Canada. God needs a man in Kenya. God needs a man in Zambia. God needs a man in, in Afghanistan. And what if he sends you? This thing you are doing, are you sure you'll be able to replicate it outside the context of Enugu? This is why beyond what we see, we must seek to encounter God. Because until we encounter God, we don't carry what God has. The second medium through which God anoints men is through men. And I will take time to speak about this when I begin to talk on how to receive the anointing. Many people, there's a move rising now on the internet. What is that move about? They want to discredit the possibility that a man carries something with God and he can commit it. They want to bring rebellion to the heart of the younger generation and bring them to a point where they no longer honor fathers and authorities. And so when you start honoring fathers, they say you are trying to gain relevance through association. If relevance by association is what makes men voices in the body of Christ, why not try it? Why not start calling the names of people and see if that will make you a voice? Do you know what it means for men to sit down to hear a man to the spirit? We are in a, in a fast generation. For a man to sit down for 30 minutes and hear you. You think it's just by calling the name of another man that somebody will shut down his life and sit down by data to listen to you. Not for one week, not for one month, not for one year, not for two years. You are joking. You don't know what is going on. When God exhausts the horn of men, know that they have something with God. And when God wants to anoint people, many times he routes them to other men. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, from verse 5 to 4, 4 to 5, Paul met Jesus in his glory. The glorified Christ appeared to Paul. And he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. In case you will say it was an angel, he introduced himself. I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. And Paul said, what will you have me do? I thought Jesus would tell him, go to the ends of the earth and preach the gospel. Jesus said, rise up, go into the city, you will be told what to do. How can a man meet the glorified Christ and he repairs him to another man? I thought you said the gospel is only about Jesus. I thought you said we are preaching men. Is Jesus too preaching men? How can a man meet Jesus in his glory? Not the Jesus that before resurrection. The Jesus after resurrection. The Jesus after ascension. The Jesus after glorification. Met Paul and said, go into the city. You'll be told what to do. And Paul will go into the city and wait for three days. Because Jesus is still deliberating with that man to agree. Why didn't Jesus go to another man? And he said, go and meet this man. He is praying. And the man will say, no, I've heard the record of this guy. That he has vexed your church. 
He has killed many. He has arrested many. Why will I do this? And Jesus will be negotiating with the man to go and anoint him. And then somebody wakes up today and say that you are not preaching Christ. Is Jesus preaching men? You see where error is creeping into the body of Christ. And gullible people who don't discern will hear funny things, fables, and they will be led astray. Ananias will agree and come to Paul. In Acts chapter 9, verse 17, he puts his hand on him and says, Brother Saul, receive the Holy Spirit. The Jesus who appeared to you on the road sent me to you. Now rise up. And Ananias will anoint Paul. After Paul met Jesus from heaven. Why didn't Jesus impart him with the Holy Spirit? Why didn't Jesus put the anointing upon him? He will send him to another man. The man will be reluctant. Jesus will persuade him to go and meet Paul. And he will show up and lay hands on Paul for Paul to receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit. If we are not careful, we will be a naked generation. Hey, huh? In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, God will want to raise a king after Israel asked for a king. And he had made up his mind already to anoint David. And God will send Samuel and say, go to the house of Jesse and anoint his son as king. Why won't God just anoint him? And Samuel will come attempting to anoint Eliab. And God will quickly say, stop. Because if that oil rests on his head, he's anointed. Stop! I have not chosen him. He said, man, look at the outward. I check the heart. Wait! And the guy will sit down. They will bring one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sons. And God will reject all of them until they will bring David. And Samuel will pour the oil on David. And the Bible will say, from that day, the Spirit of God rested upon David. Why wouldn't God send the Spirit on David? I'm telling you why we are powerless with all our revelation. We have dishonored custodians. And a generation is being mentored to continually dishonor them. Only God anoints men, but there are mediums through which God does that. It could be through an encounter, and it could be through the medium of other men. That's why the Bible said in Hebrews six twelve, it said, "Follow them who through faith and patience obtain the promise." Follow them. Follow them. It's an admonition of scriptures. Follow them. What we are doing is highly spiritual. It's not a joke. This is real. Life and death depends on it. Men will die and men will survive because men carry anointings. And if those anointings are gone, a generation might be lost. Because in the day of trouble, English language will not suffice. In the day of war, grammar will not suffice. In the day when spirits show up from darkness, facts will not be enough. You will need men that have a walk with God. Men that have things to show, to rise up and speak on behalf of the body of Christ. Study the scripture. It's replete. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 15 to 17, God wanted to anoint kings and prophets. And the same Elijah that God was rejecting. You know, when you start talking these things, they try to pick the errors of men. Listen, we know some of these fathers are not perfect. We know. But we don't honor them because they are perfect. Do you honor your biological father because he's perfect? Are you not a hypocrite? 
When was the last time you rose up publicly to assault your biological father? With all the error and garbage he carries. But when it comes to a spiritual context, they want to rubbish men that have a walk with God for years. You know how many souls this man won? You know how many warriors they built for God? You know how many times they endangered their lives? As small as I am here, I can tell you how many times I've passed through death because of this kingdom. Just two weeks ago, I left Abuja to Kaduna around 3.15 p.m. Because I needed to be there. Even the military guys that work with me said, it's too late. That journey will take two hours, 40 minutes. And so you may be on that road by 6 p.m. That's when bandits attack. But the Holy Ghost will not let me. You will go for this meeting. As small as I am. And then you talk about a man that has served God for 40 years, for 50 years. Do you know how many times he has risked his life? Why not leave your studio and go and preach the gospel in Gombe once? Why not leave your studio and go to Meduguri and win five souls? Then come back and tell us about serving God. Leave your studio. That place where you hide without an identity. Go to the streets of Pakistan. If you are able to say Jesus is Lord. You think it's to sit behind a studio and preach to people online? What do you know about serving God? What do you know about truth? What do you know about integrity? We are not saying people are not wrong, but shut up. Don't try to dismantle things that are eternal. Do you know the kingdom of God? You just... Oh my. I say these things with a body. Because a generation is about to lose an inheritance. Some of the things we carry, they are handed over. Because men are custodians. The anointing on Elijah does not belong to Elijah. It belongs to generations. And so a point come, Elijah can't go to heaven with it. Even though Elijah wanted to go to heaven, he fell. He didn't give it. He fell. Because it doesn't belong to him. And if you don't know that these things are handed over, you will be preaching your revelation, trying to please men. And in the day of battle, you will discover you are naked. Do you know when they call people? Those who are ministers, ask those who reach them. It's around 12 midnight to 2 a.m. That people are calling you. When you pick, they say, we know this is the time we will reach you. And sometimes it's not even an emergency. Somebody calls you 1 a.m. You pick. He say, I had a dream. Because the anointing puts a responsibility on you. You can't be angry. Because if you are, the Holy Ghost will be angry with you. And then you think it's by researching one or two mistakes on Facebook. And sit down to talk. Do you know the kingdom? When God chose Elisha, even though Elisha was God's man, God came and told Elijah, remember, Elijah had been rejected. God had rejected him. And God told him, go and anoint Elisha as prophet in your stead. I have rejected you, but there is something on you that I can't deny. I put it there. And before you leave, somebody else must collect it. And God will command Elijah to go and anoint Elijah. Because God doesn't have need for him anymore. And then you sit down, you think that because somebody made an error, they should crucify him. Do you know what God kept on him? Do you know what God hid in that man? We don't validate their mistakes. And we don't encourage anybody to learn from it. Remember, the men we follow, we don't only learn their good. God allows us to follow them to also learn their mistakes so that we can be better. So we are conscious of their error. But we also know that there is something they carry. And that thing they carry, we must receive it. This is not human worship. When you honor your father, you are not worshiping him. 
except in your own training and where you come from. Honor is worship. When you honor your father, when you greet your father, are you worshiping him? You hear garbage and you are wondering where do the, where are these people come? Why this come? Then you will discover that we are helpless. You think God who left them there is not wise? You think God who left them there did not see their mistakes? When you take them out, who can stand to say restore? Who can stand? The crisis we are going through in Nigeria. Why do you think certain things and certain thresholds have not been crossed? It's because there are certain men they know because they are present. There are things they cannot do. And then you come, you say they made this mistake. You crucify them. If those men leave, can you stay in your, in your, in your state and call the name of Jesus? You don't know what people carry. And then we glorify those who have died. And those who are alive, we crucify them. This is why a generation is not being anointed. Because we can't discern the vessels who carry it. How many people have encounters? If I took a census here now, how many of you have had encounters before? You'll be shocked that out of 100, maybe only 5 have had encounters. If God anoints only by encounters, how many will be anointed? Do you know the price you pay to be encountered? There are laws that govern encounter. One of the laws that governs encounter is of total, total, total search for God. Seek for Him with all your heart. How many men here can search for God? If God said we anoint only encounters, how many will be anointed? This is why He creates other channels apart from encounters to anoint men. Because he knows we are growing. Please sit down. Yeah, yeah. Ah, ah, anointing. Since I started talking in this direction, maybe I begin from this one. It's by honor. This would have been the last. But I've doubled into it already. You, and you receive the anointing by honoring the vessels that carry it. You dishonor them, God can never use them to anoint you because it's a law in the spirit. In Hebrews chapter 7 verse 7, it says without every contradiction, it says the less is blessed of the better. It's a law. If you don't honor a man, even your heart can't open to receive from that man. No matter how you try. This is why we teach the culture of honor. Because the culture of honor helps you to open your heart to receive. And if your heart is not open, you can never be anointed. In Genesis 27, from verse 7 to 9, Joseph wanted to transfer the inheritance to his son. And he said, get for me a savory venison. Let me eat that my soul may bless you. They knew the strategy. They knew the principle. They knew the order of transference. Show me honor. My soul can open to bless you. I know you are the one God has chosen. I know God has ordained you. I know God will take the spirit upon me and put on you. But show me honor. Let my soul connect to your soul. If you don't honor me, my soul can connect to you. These are patriarchs of old. They knew the landmarks. They found it in the spirit. And they know that these things can never be denied. When a man of God will find a generation fighting every servant of God. Be careful. It's a strategy of the devil. There are three things the devil achieves when he does that. Number one, he blocks the channel of inheritance. You will see a generation rise 
with so much revelation, but they cannot see the attendant manifestation. We will teach power. It will be more intelligent than all the fathers put together. The fathers with their little revelation will see power. We may not see it. Meanwhile, we will teach power better than them, but we will not see power. We will teach all the doctrines of healing. You will never see one witch here in our meeting that is raised. All our anointing ends with people falling under the power. The fathers will show up and just talk for five minutes and ten witch years will be empty. Does it not suggest to you something is wrong? Because there is a truncation in inheritance. Your own biological father, do you dishonor them to receive their inheritance? Who told you you would do it in the spirit and it will work? We don't teach the culture of honor to deify men. The Bible said to raise men not to be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. You honor men because you have been trained to discern. And a mature believer knows the difference between honor and worship. Even God himself, in Ephesians chapter 6 from verse 1 and 2, he said, honor your father in the Lord. And he said, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long. That means if I want to keep you on earth for long, you may make it difficult for me if you dishonor your biological parents. As powerful and as sovereign as I am, I may not be able to keep you for earth for, on earth for long if you dishonor your parents. So in case you want to live long, better be careful to honor your parents. That is God talking. And then you find people show up trying to disconnect a generation from an inheritance. Listen, there is a weakness that is with someone that needs to rest on you. There is an authority that is with someone. God has chosen you for that authority. Don't allow discernment, uh, allow dishonor, shut down your discernment so that you will see that person and you will not connect and receive. I know these things have been abused. People have become irresponsible in the name of tapping from one another. I know it has been abused. But if somebody abuses a reality, correct the person and don't put down a principle. The principle is older than you. And if our generation is not taught, we will end up with emotions and psychology. This is why this is the only generation people pride themselves in prayer. Now when men are talking, it's prayer. Prayer power, prayer time, prayer posture. Prayer was normal in the days of the fathers. Everybody prayed. Nobody came to say his record of prayer. But when you pray, they check you. Is there brokenness? Is there power? Is there authority? Is the byproduct of prayer they look out for? But our generation is so, is so naked because we don't have anything to show. We have to make a show of flesh. And people pride themselves that they are prayer champions. Nobody cares how long you can pray. It's what your prayer can produce that people look out for. They say, as soon as Zion traveled, she brought forth her children. It's not your traveling we are looking for. It's the children of your travail we are looking for. But it's our helplessness before situations that makes us to begin to dry and pride ourselves in the things that our youthful energy can generate. All this your prayer posture and prayer movement. If you are 60, will you operate like that? It's youthfulness. That's not authority. I'm telling you, error is creeping in gradually. Today, people call authority a wet suit. And so when we pray, we want to appear on the internet with wet suit. So that people will see how wet. My suit is already wet. This is no authority. If there's authority, when I finish, I'll pray for these people. We will walk. If not, this sweat is nonsense. If this is not the authority, the sweat is not the authority. You can put it on Facebook. People can shout and call your name. You can even hug the puppet while praying. That's childishness. It's not the travail of Zion men are looking for. It's the offsprings of Zion. When we are naked, we start looking for things to cover up. And one of the reasons we are naked is because of dishonor. We don't know how to receive inheritances. We don't know. Number two, this error they are peddling that they don't know. By the time our generation successfully disconnects from fathers and begin to dishonor them, we will become rebels. You will find a lawless generation 
where nobody can correct anybody. I showed up from Pakistan with exploits of faith and I sat on the internet and spoke about my experiences. Everybody was clapping. My father-in-law called me and said, you have heard. He said, this thing you said, this thing you said, this thing is not for public consumption. Which other person would tell me that? Every other person was clapping. My God, you went to an Islamic nation. Jesus, this is an apostle of God. When an old man zoomed in carefully, he said, no, you shouldn't have said this. You shouldn't have said this. You shouldn't have said this. I took dressing. When there are no men who have authority over a generation, they may be very anointed, but they will equally be lawless and rebels. And at the end of the day, they will make more harvest for the devil than they will ever make for Jesus. Before when I'm preaching, for the first one hour, all I'll be saying will be mysteries. But, he doesn't call me apostle. He say, Michael, how are you? <laughs> if he call, Michael, how are you? Where are you? No, but which apostle what? <laughs> when did you? How are you? He sat me down and said, number one, keep the message simple. The message, simple. It's called the gospel. It's good news. When you have an encounter, discuss it with those who have those encounters with you. When you come out to preach to the body of Christ, they should understand what you are saying and be transformed. He said, number two, do away with pride. People see me, they say, fire, fire. In the fire, he saw arrogance. Do away with the pride. Don't be arrogant. Pride goeth before you fall. Number three, don't, don't, don't destroy yourself. You don't know the God that placed men over men is wiser than you. There was no anointing there. It was instructions and commandments. He said, no matter what men do to you, Never be bitter. He said, when you are bitter, stop preaching. Your priesthood is corrupt. Go and wait on the Lord and purge your heart. And he said, never do to people the way they did to you. Do to them as God has commanded you. And then you want us to stand up tomorrow and begin to talk that we too have become wise. When you say this thing, they claim that you are trying to exalt men or you are trying to gain relevance by association. Do they know what these things are in the kingdom? Paul, the great apostle, in Galatians chapter 2, he said, I went to Jerusalem by revelation. And he said, I went to meet Peter and the disciples so that I would not have run my race in vain. This is the same Paul that said, the gospel I preach, no man taught me. I received it from the Lord. Why will he now say he's going to Peter? Was he trying to gain relevance? He knows about the elderly generation. The younger generation will end up as rebels and lawless men. If you find a generation, a person or a people that nobody can instruct them and they are not accountable to anybody, run for your life. When the generation becomes wise, they look for authorities deliberately to submit to. There are certain contexts when those authorities are men. And there are certain contexts where those authorities are laws that govern systems. For example, if you go to the Catholic setting, if you go to the Methodist setting, they may not have men as symbol of authority, but they have laws that govern them. They have presbyteries. If you come to the Pentecostal setting, they have men. Whichever way you find yourself, make sure you're under authority. Don't let anybody talk you into dishonor. There is no inheritance attached to it. This is why you can pray for 40 days 
and yet not be anointed. Because God will be afraid of committing power to you. You are without a checker. You are without authority. Without a law over your soul. If you can speak and you are not afraid that somebody can call you and say what is the meaning of this, then you are in error. There's problem. Wait until it manifests. You will be shocked the level of error you will pioneer. In fact, even when you become an elder and those you have submitted to have died, what you do is that you have accountability cycle. Friends that can talk to you in the face. At every point, a man must have authority over him. This is what the devil wants to do to our generation. And this is why God is afraid of anointing us. God is afraid. And this is why I'm sharing this. I'm not sharing this to glorify anybody. I'm careful not to call people's names. I called God's servant's name by mistake because I just wanted to tell you what he told me. But I'm telling you this. God is afraid of anointing our generation. The things we are doing. Imagine if one apostle in Nigeria can fill the stadium and raise 10 cripples. Imagine what will happen. Why do you think those things are not happening? We have prayed to the level of being able to raise cripples. Not one, not two, not three, not four, not five. More than ten in one meeting. We have revelation enough to be able to raise cripples over ten in one meeting. We have enough consecration. Listen, if I tell you the consecration that some of the apostles I know keep, you will shout. But with the revelation, with the prayer power, with the consecration, God has withdrawn authority. Because he knows until a generation comes under full authority, that generation is a threat to what God wants to achieve. And so if we don't honor authorities and submit, our generation may pass without power. Go and listen to the men that wrote wonders in the days of old. What did they preach? What did they preach? I have followed men. What did they preach? No special revelation. But God was always there. Remember in Mark 16, 20, they said the Lord walking with them, confirming the world with signs. <laughs> And sometimes you, you find these people talking. You can literally sense bitterness. You can literally, you can sense envy. You can sense jealousy. Because they don't have what it takes. For a man to correct the body, there are three credentials he must have. Number one is love. If you don't love the body, you can't correct the body. The Bible says, speaking the truth in love. When you find people speaking in bitterness, in sentiment, in envy, just shut your ears out. Before you know, bitterness will enter your soul. Number two, you cannot speak the truth except as you are speaking in faith. So when you find people who speak the truth, they say it in faith. The boldness is by the spirit. It's not based on intelligence. It's not based on research. I have studied and then they are talking, you are seeing pride, born out of eloquence and mental prowess. That's not what authorizes you to speak over the body of Christ. There is a faith, operation of faith that moves in your soul to be able to bring counsel per time. If that spirit of faith is not at work, you can't address the body. And number three, a man who addresses the body of Christ are you following? This is not my conventional style, but bear with me. I'm trying to fight something. There's a beast of reckless wickedness that is trying to enter the body of Christ. And if we don't speak like this, by the mercy of God, God has opened the heart of youth to listen to some of us. And so it's our responsibility to correct them from certain things. So they know why we do what we do. We don't honor fathers just because we want to create impression. We know the danger. If we don't honor those who have gone ahead of us, we cannot receive the promise. He said, be a followers of them who through faith and patience obtain the promise. You don't follow them, you can't obtain the promise. 
Number two, if we don't follow them or honor them, we can never be accurate. When power comes, when influence comes, lawlessness will enter our soul. Full of faith, and you must be full of understanding to be able to talk to the body of Christ. And so, one of the things that is stopping us from walking in the tangible dimension of the anointing is dishonor. As simple as this thing sounds, this is why we are not empowered. And the reason God will not anoint us is because if he does, then it's a breach of the law of inheritance. If he does, we will become rebels and lawless people. And the impact and effect after a long time will be devastating. And number three, the reason God insists on honor before the anointing is because spiritual things are a dynasty. You can trace Jesus back to Adam. Nobody just appears. We are a lineage in the spirit. Nobody appears. We are a lineage. That's why when you find a man, you can trace his history in the spirit. You can trace him. Because we are a lineage. The same way you have physical genealogy, you also have spiritual genealogy. And if you study the genealogy of Jesus, it was not biological. Because Rahab had nothing to do in Jesus' biological family tree. It's a spiritual genealogy. God cannot truncate the genealogy of the spirit just because he wants to anoint you. And when you find a generation that truly honors and are anointed, you will discover that it's not just the manifestation of the anointing you will see. The consecration will also be transferred. The discipline will also be transferred. The wisdom will also be transferred. So that that anointing is kept within the boundary of safety. Because anointings don't exist on their own. That's why if you are not connected to a genealogy in the spirit, you can't walk in the anointing. Every anointing has their consecrations. Every anointing has their disciplines. So when you see a man who is anointed, underlining that anointing are disciplines and consecrations that defines the spiritual essence. It's not in our place to rebuke the fathers. When we see errors, we learn from it, we take dressing. How many times have you sat down and called for a family meeting to rebuke your biological father? Before you want to call the body of Christ together to rebuke the fathers. Are you not a hypocrite? If it is not permissible in the natural, who told you it is permissible in the spiritual? May God help us to discern. And what I'm teaching you now, I'm not telling you to go and start lying down for everybody. Everything we do is by discernment. It's by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Because not every elder is your father. You have to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit to trace you and to lead you to the one you are supposed to come under his government. There are some that will mentor you for a lifetime. There are some that will mentor you for a season. When that season is complete, you will know. And the Holy Ghost will lead you to move forward. And so when your season is accomplished, respectfully, go there, go under that authority, and tell them what God is telling you. And let them de- release you to go. When Paul was done for Antioch, he said the elders laid hands on them and released them. It may not be a public show, but by all means, receive a release letter. They should tell you you are released, and then you go forward. And if you find people that should train you for a lifetime, no matter how big you are, remain under that government. The day you move, you will become lawless. The day you move, you will be disconnected from inheritance. And the day you move, you will be cut off from a family, a spiritual family and genealogy. I'm telling you this. This is why you find generations rise that have nothing to show for calling on the name of the Lord. They love God, they pray, they serve God, they call the name of Jesus, but they cannot see the impact of their service. They cannot see the impact of calling the name of the Lord. Simple, but these are eternal truths. They are ancient landmarks. Nothing can truncate it. Not even the rise of technology. 
Number two, which is where I wanted to start. Because this honor thing actually was the least. But probably, that's where God wanted me to start from. You want to be genuinely anointed. The second thing that provokes the release of the anointing is yieldedness to the Holy Spirit. This is actually the first. But I don't know how my teachings went that it became the second. The second thing that provokes the receipt of the anointing is yieldedness to the Holy Spirit. You may not feel emotional tonight, but learn these things I teach you. This will define the next phase of your experience with God. You'll find a man who is genuinely anointed of God. He is thoroughly yielded to the Holy Spirit. I teach it again and again and again. In John chapter 1, from verse 1 to verse 4, the Bible gave us four credentials of Jesus. He said, in the beginning was the world. He said, the world was with God and the world was God. The Bible clearly called Jesus God. Number two, he said, all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. The Bible clearly called Jesus creator. Are you following me? He called him God. He called him creator. Number three, he said in him was life. The Bible clearly called him the author of life. And number four, he said that life was the light of man. The Bible called him light. Jesus introduced as God, as creator, as life, and as light. But for 30 years, creator, God, life, light was in Zebulun. Zebulun was in darkness. For 30 years, creator walked amongst men. He was helpless. No blind eye opened. No deaf ear opened. No cripple walked. No gospel was preached to usher men into the kingdom. Why? His credential was nothing without the enablement of the Holy Spirit. So long as you are putting on flesh, the Holy Ghost must enable you. Thirty years later, we will hear Jesus in Matthew 3.15 come to the, the baptismal service of John to be baptized. And John will clearly discern him. You are the son of God. I'm not worthy to unloose the latchet of your sandal. And Jesus said, suffer so for now. Thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. What was Jesus saying? I acknowledge what you acknowledge. Creation should not baptize creator. I formed you. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. I am your creator. But this is the route the Holy Ghost is taking. And so for now, even though the law of the Spirit said, the lesser is blessed of the greater. The Holy Ghost has choose an unfamiliar route. And if I must receive the power of the Holy Spirit, I must yield. So he said, suffer it to be so for now. And so John dips him into the water and baptizes him. As he came out, he was praying as he has always prayed. But suddenly the heavens opened and the Holy Ghost came upon him. As if that was not enough. That was one layer. In Matthew 4, 1, the Bible said the Spirit led him into the wilderness. Not to be coronated. He said to be tempted of the devil. Are you seeing the unfamiliar route the Holy Ghost is taking him through? First, the Holy Ghost makes creator to be baptized by creation. And then the Holy Ghost now leads him to be tempted. Meanwhile, Jesus has already taught in the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation. Why would the Holy Ghost be leading you into temptation? The law of yieldedness demands that even when you don't understand, believe. You'll find out why people are not yet anointed. They want to understand everything. They want to understand why God is doing everything. And before they finish understanding one tenth of what God is doing, they are 90 years old. Did you not read that his wisdom and his ways are past finding out? Two things that were outright contradictions 
But Jesus understood yieldedness to a fault. You are creator. Go, let creation baptize you. He obeyed. Now, stand up. If you read Mark 1.12, he didn't say he was led. He said he was driven. He was driven to the wilderness. That means the Holy Ghost was almost subjugating his will. He was compelled to the wilderness. And he was told outrightly, you are going to be tempted. But the temptation was not from Satan. The temptation was actually either to yield or not to yield. And when he yielded, hope you know, that's the kind of temptation that God suffers. When he was in Gethsemane, it was a battle of yieldedness. Father, this is not my will. If it were possible, let this cup pass me by. Nevertheless, let thy will be done. Matthew 26, 39 and 42. That was the temptation that Jesus suffered. And he was led to the wilderness. And the devil was done tempting him. I thought God would say congratulations. Suddenly. In Luke 4, 14, he said he returned in the power of the spirit. He returned in the power of the spirit. That means when yieldedness is accomplished, the byproduct is not congratulations, it's anointing. When you pass the test of you deadness, God doesn't tell you well done. He anoints you. He didn't return with congratulations. He returned with the power of the Spirit. Suddenly, Jesus that was in the temple for 30 years entered the temple and demons began to scream. Get away from us, son of David. Are you just recognizing him? Were you blind? Were you blind? The man who went up was a yielded carpenter. The one who came down was the light of God. Because the Bible said the land of Zebulun. It said the land of Naphtali. By the way of the sea beyond Jordan. Galilee of the Gentile. The people which sat in darkness had seen a great light. The question is, for the first 30 years, what was he? Was he darkness? What was he? He was in darkness, but he didn't have the ability to bring forth light. It was after yieldedness was complete that he began to bring forth light. Most of you think is because you heard the story of somebody who fasted for 40 days. If you fast for 40 days, you'll be anointed. You will end up with Osa. I'm telling you, I know it by experience. I went to do a test some years ago. They found out the acid content of my stomach. The pH was very low. The acid was so high. And the doctor said, no, with this pH, you should have Osa. And they went and did a, a, a test on the wall of my stomach. And they discovered I was one of the few lucky people. Because two things happen. When the acid content of your stomach becomes too corrosive, it will abrase the wall of your stomach. It will scrub it. It will corrode it. That's what you call ulcer. But there are few people that instead of corroding it, the wall thickens. And because the wall becomes thicker, instead of having ulcer, they have a thicker intestinal wall. That was what happened to me. If not, I would have been an ulcer patient now. And fasting would have ended for me forever and ever. Still not anointed. I'm telling you, people show up and say, fast for 21 days, you'll receive this type of anointing. Fast for 40 days, you'll receive this type Go and do it. If you don't come back with Osa, or come back with an encounter with a demon, I assure you, you will come down with pride. And for all your life, you will start preaching how many years you fasted. You don't get anointed by fasting for 40 days. You will get anointed because you are yielded to the Holy Spirit. When you yield to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit can prescribe 40 days fast. The Holy Spirit can prescribe 7 hours tongues for 3 weeks. The Holy Spirit can empty your bank account. Anything he prescribes based on how he made you and the nature of anointing he wants to give you, he will prescribe. Only then will you be anointed. We are not yielded people. We want to fast for 100 days so that when we show up, we'll say, do you know how many days I've fasted? And then only pride and arrogance come out of us, not anointing. When the Holy Ghost leads you, even yourself will know that while you were here doing it, it was because he helped you. That was why you accomplished it. So you will come out from there 
not proud, but broken. And it is in that vent of brokenness that the anointing flows. I'm showing you the things we have lost. Men are following formulas. Men are following stories of other men. And they don't know why they end up going nowhere. A story of a man can inspire you. But only the leadership of the Holy Spirit can empower you. I'm telling you. We are not yielded. This is a generation that wants to fast for 90 days. So that they will put it on their brochure. The moment you open them, you'll see 90 days fast. They want to pray in tongues for three months and put it on their brochure. If God leads you to talk about your exploit, it will encourage somebody to talk about it. But never make the mistake of thinking those things you did in the flesh is the reason why God leaves you. God will lift you to the degree that you obey Him. He will lift you to the degree of your yieldedness. Because your yieldedness is a testimony of a lack of confidence in flesh. Paul said in Philippians 3 verse 3, we are the circumcision that worships God in the spirit, rejoicing in Christ Jesus, having no confidence in the flesh. Any man who is genuinely anointed will tell you that the Holy Ghost told me what to do. I did it. I became anointed. When you find a man who traces the anointing to something other than the Holy Spirit, that's not the Holy Ghost. It can be a charismatic expression, not the anointing. And if you want to check it, Either you test the spirit by discernment or you bring real life problem. You will see how helpless he is before those problems. You want to test the spirit, check him. When he's talking, you will sense pride. When he's talking, you will sense bitterness. When he's talking, you will sense competition. Because many times, what took us to the mountain is not God, it's competition. Somebody raised people, so me too, I must raise people. And then you go and fast for 40 days. When you are done carrying out your stunt, Come back and start learning from the Holy Spirit. You want to find out why the fathers were anointed? These are the secrets. They were yielded to God. What you read as principles were actually the testimonies of their submission to the Holy Spirit. They did it until it became a life force and they left it as a memorial for generations to come. I'm not discouraging you from prayers. You're strengthening your spirit by praying. I'm not discouraging you from fasting. You, you, you activate the sensitivity of your spirit through fasting. But I am telling you, if it is the anointing of the Holy Ghost you are looking for, the Holy Ghost himself must lead you. If it doesn't drive you, you can never be anointed. When he's done with you, he can choose to give you an encounter or he will send you to a man. And when you meet that man with ease, whether that man likes it or not, you'll be anointed. Hope you know some of the things we receive from men. If they have their way, they won't give us. <laughs> have you not seen men that people receive something from them by mistake? And the thing pains them so much that they want those people to submit their life to them forever and ever and become their slave. Because it pains them. How did this person receive this thing? If they had their way, they would have reserved it for their children 20 years later to give it to them. Now that you have picked it from them, every time they see you doing anything and you don't give them glory, they want to die. Angry and bitter. And you can sense it. That this thing, they didn't give you. You took it. Aliyah! Please sit down, sit down, sit down. Kai, Kai, Kai. Don't trouble my, don't trouble my water. The last thing that makes for a genuine anointing is righteous hunger. I try to choose these words carefully. Righteous hunger. You know, before now, I thought, it as, I thought it as hunger. But after a while, the Holy Ghost began to teach me wisdom. And he said, not every hunger is consistent with the will of God. I just give you one example now. Because 
One person from the fellowship is preaching and they are inviting him. The next person wants to die on the mountain. Because one person prays and two blind eyes open. The next person wants to kill himself with fasting. That's not righteous hunger. That is flesh on rampage. You know what righteous hunger is? It's a hunger for the kingdom of God to go forward. That was what Gideon had. In the days of Gideon, the Midianite enslaved Israel. Judges chapter 6. And Gideon was bodied. He said, where is the God that walked wonders through our fathers? Where is the God that parted the Red Sea? It was not because anybody was doing anything. It was a burden for Israel. And so when you have that kind of hunger, you are permitted to fast and pray. If God sees your consistency, he will appear to you. Because your body is not self-oriented. Let me tell you, one of the operations of the spirit of this age is self-preservation. Find out the foundation of wickedness. The foundation of witchcraft. The foundation of evil is self-preservation. Whether in church or outside the church. When a man is able to conquer flesh and self and begins to fight for the interest of Yahweh, anything he does can anoint him. And so the reason our generation is not anointed, we don't care about God. We don't care about others. We only care about our reputation. We care about influence. We care about fame. Mistakenly accuse a man and see the defense he will bring on the internet to clear his name. Anything that touches our name, we want to die. But what you will know is that if it is God's kingdom you are pursuing, welcome on board. They will harass you, they will accuse you, they will attack you. Don't bother about self-defense. The Lord will be your defense because he is your shield and your exceeding great reward. Only speak when it has to do with God's kingdom. Elijah said, I am terribly vexed. First Kings 19 verse 10. For the Lord God of hosts. For they have killed their prophet. They have destroyed their altar. And there is no more. And the only one left. He had bodies for God. When you see men who have hunger for God. Jesus. The only time we saw it as if he lost control. Was when he came to the temple and it was defied. And Jesus showed up. My goodness. You are turning the house of God to a den of wolves and thieves. And he made a cord of many whip and flogged them out. That is hunger. When a man has have such passion for the things of God, he's about to be anointed. Moses was not concerned about himself. He saw Israel oppressing Egypt, an Egyptian oppressing an Israelite. He pained him to his bones. He killed the Egyptian. That was the body that took him to Horeb. You want to be anointed. Stay with God until he replaces your selfish ambition with the, with the bodies in the heart of the Father. When those bodies come to your heart and you begin to prosecute them in prayer, prosecute them in fasting, you are about to be dangerously anointed. There are certain men, they see the sick in the body of Christ. They can't sleep. Lord, how can we profess your name? Yet so many people are sick. If you will anoint me, Father. If you will anoint me, sickness will be defeated in my generation. God sees it. It's a burden in the heart of God. There are many people that look around and they say, why are so many people godless? Everywhere we turn, there's iniquity. Lord, anoint me. I want to wreck people to the kingdom. Did you not read about Rehab Bonke? He said his ambition in life is to depopulate hell and populate hell. Why will he not gather 10 million people? It was not a self-centered ambition. It was about the kingdom. And when God saw it, God gave him influence. God gave him healing power. God gave him favor with men. Anywhere the guy shows up, whether you are Muslim, Hindu, Christian, regardless of tradition, regardless of belief, regardless of class or pedigree, everybody went to Rehab Bonkey's meeting. The anointing was born out of a hunger to see men live hell. When you have such burdens, God is about to anoint you. Why do you think God sent Moses back to Egypt? He was tired of seeing Israel pressed by the Egyptians. You will not see the healing anointing until you are tired of seeing men sick. 
when you are tired of seeing men sick and it's not a show to you, God can anoint you. And when God genuinely anoints you with the healing oil, the flow and the channel of that anointing will be compassion. When you see the sick, that compassion will flow like a river. Because that was the burden that took you to seeking God. You want souls to be one into the kingdom. God will anoint you with influence and authority. Suddenly, doors will begin to open to you. Your goal is not you want to preach in London. Your goal is not I want to preach in Zambia. Your goal is not I want to preach in Ghana. Your goal is I want to see souls one for the kingdom. And because you are pressing there, a point will come an anointing that gives you utterance, influence and favor will rest upon you. You will sit in your room. Doors will keep opening. Somebody has thinks it's about flyers and billboards. Somebody has thinks it's about notification on Facebook and YouTube. You will pray and die on the altar. You don't have passion for souls. And you want to be a traveling minister. What do you want to do? You think God has time for your gullible sentiment. Souls are going to hell. You are thinking God will announce you. For the pride of saying the next apostle has shown up. The next prophet is here. This is the next ring had bunker. And then you put a placard online. You are joking. You don't know the kingdom. You want to be anointed. You must find a body in the kingdom. That body must overwhelm you. And you must prosecute that body. When God sees that that body has become the breath on your nursery, he will invade you with an anointing you cannot contain. A point will come, you will beg God, reduce your hand, this thing is too heavy. I met a man who had hunger for the body to walk in righteousness. God anointed this man with intercessory power. There was a time the man laid on the floor, flat, for three and a half months. 13 hours every day in intercession. Weeping and crying. His forehead was injured. For many days, his forehead has become black. Because of where he scrubbed it on the ground. 13 hours every day. But the burden was so much, he didn't even realize he was being injured. If that man enters here now, he can't pray for 10 minutes. He talks for a few minutes, he starts weeping. And as he's crying, suddenly the weight of God's glory will fall in the building. Everybody will start crying. Encounters will begin to happen. I took him to Nsuka for a meeting with some of my friends. I preached the first day. He preached the second day. I had three slots. When I saw him preach, I knew it was a sin for me to preach the third day. Me that they called a fiery preacher. When I saw the I came up and said, please, all of us need this man to speak to us. I had to give him my slot and sow the seed into his life. Both of us came as ministers. But I saw somebody that carried something that the generation was was lacking. And for those four days, he held us spellbound. He comes to the altar like the wage reviver. As he's weeping, people are coming from the hostels. Some people walked into the meeting. They said Jesus met them on the walkway. Some people came into the meeting. They say a lion, lion appeared and entered into them. And people were coming to the meeting on their own accord. All of us were on the floor weeping. For four days we wept. He didn't preach for more than two hours. Because of the weight that was on his life. Don't let him carry the microphone. You won't know when you will leave your seat and sit down and start repenting. You won't know when you will leave your seat and sit down and start begging God to help you. Because there was a weight of glory on his life. That body came because he sought God and he told God, what is it that you want? And God said, I want men to seek me. Is that all you want? And he sentenced his life. A point came, we gave him invitations. Please, the body of Christ needs to hear you. He said, I'm not released. I would have loved to come and preach, but I'm not released. God will arrest him like Ezekiel. Hope you know Ezekiel will lie down on one side for 390 days. And he will turn to the other side and lie down for 40 days. He was not praying for a car. He was praying for the sins of Israel and Judah. You don't have body for God's kingdom or for God's people and you are looking for anointing. What do you need it for? You want to operate in word of knowledge and in two years you want one soul. What is the word of knowledge for? You are looking for slain in power and you have not won anybody to the kingdom. What do you think the anointing is meant for? The anointing is meant for advancing the kingdom of God. 
And only those who have the kingdom of God as their priority are qualified to be anointed. You want to see anointing? There must be honor in your spirit. You want to see anointing? You must be yielded to the Holy Spirit. You want to see anointing? The body for the kingdom must substitute your personal ambition. God doesn't anoint men by mistakes. No, he doesn't. He doesn't anoint men by mistake. He said deliberately. Every man you see who is anointed genuinely is a custodian. You want to pray now? This is the time. Just bend down and talk to the Lord. Some of us truly, truly, what we need to do now is to repent. I'm telling you. Some of us, what we need to do is repent. Our dishonor and arrogance has already disqualified us. We are just not aware. Some of us, our rebellion to the Holy Spirit has already made it impossible for us to be ever anointed. And some of us, our self-centeredness, selfishness, and personal ego and ambition has already disqualified us. If you truly help me, some of us need to repent. the fathers. If you like, call it whatever you want. I saw Paul do it in the Bible. I saw many great patriots do it in the Bible. In fact, God himself introduced himself after the fathers that have walked before the next generation. He said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Paul said, I went to Jerusalem to meet Peter so that I will not have run in vain. If Paul was not looking for relevant by association, then if you like, call it whatever you want. This generation, we will follow those landmarks. I want to pray for you tonight. But before I pray for you, some of you, listen. Some of you, you will need to ask God to help you. You have learned some things unconsciously. And you have done some things not knowing their implications. That's why your efforts are being wasted. You have given, you have emptied your bank account, yet nothing happens. You have fasted for years, nothing happened. You have prayed, nothing happened. And you don't know why. Because you were taught from Facebook and YouTube. By men who don't know God. When we teach you kingdom principles, check. This is why we share some of our testimonies. When you share testimonies, 
They say you want to create an energy around yourself to manipulate people. When Paul said he went to the third heaven, why don't you go and tell him that? When Paul was talking about his records and credentials, how he was flogged 39 times, how he was in prison, when Paul said, talked about the grace of God that walked through his life, why didn't you tell him that? When a politician does it, you clap hand. But a pastor shouldn't do it. Why are all of you supporting Peter Obi now? Is it not because of his records and antecedents? How can you follow a man who doesn't have track record? And when a man tells you his dealings with God, you say he's trying to manipulate people. Why not go to Pakistan and come back and use it to manipulate people? If it's easy to risk your life just for men to clap hands, why not risk your life a little? Do you know what it means to travel to Kaduna by night? Have you gone to Meduguri before? Have you traveled to preach and you walk through the dead before? Go to Gombe. Go to Meduguri. Go to Sokoto. Travel to the, to the eastern part of, of the world. And stand in public and call Jesus his Lord. When you do that, come back to Facebook. We will hear you. You think we risk our lives to end up coming to talk so that men will clap. Is our life so useless that I will risk my life, leave my wife, leave my son. Most of these meetings we go for, they don't give us an honorarium. Is it because we don't talk? Meanwhile, I risk my life to travel in the night. And then when we come to talk about the dealings of God, you say we are looking for applause. Why not risk your life? Abandon your wife and children and come so that they will clap for you on Facebook. What does likes do to my life? And if you think it's Facebook that makes men, why are few, why is it only few men that are made? Talking nonsense. Listen, those of you in this meeting, those online, and those who we hear later on, we don't endorse human worship, and we don't endorse the error of the fathers, but we honor them, because we know they are not perfect. And if we want to attack fathers of faith, let's begin by our own, dealing with our own biological parents. When was the last time you carried your biological parent to internet to analyze? But you pick one general overseer, pick another one. Why not start analyzing your own biological parents and your elders from your village? The wicked ones and analyze them first. And you say others are looking for relevance. What are you looking for? And you find gullible people who know nothing about the kingdom talking. You want to ask the Lord tonight to help you. Perhaps you have made a mistake. Ask him to help you. And then we will pray tonight for God to genuinely put his hand on men. Genuinely. Genuinely. Listen, we make mistakes. I told you, I'm a young man. I'm already making mistakes. So I will be foolish to think a father who has served for 50 years has not made errors that himself is ashamed of. And when I call somebody, I don't endorse him. I don't even have the stature to endorse him. That's number one. It will be pride to think I'm endorsing a father. Number two, I don't worship any man. And if there's anybody who is worshipping a man, he should be pointed out and condemned. And I will be the first to stand against it. However, you cannot lure a generation to dishonor the fathers. And in the same vein, if you are not yielded to the Holy Spirit, or you are not carrying the burden of the kingdom, don't dream of an anointing. No one will come on you. Tonight, you want to ask the Lord to help you. I may not call us out. We are out of time. Just place your hand on your chest. For some of you, it's dishonor. For some of you, it's lack of yieldedness. And for some of you, it's self-centeredness. And just in case you are here, you are not repenting, but you have never asked Jesus to become the Lord of your life. You don't have a relationship with Jesus. What we are talking about here, you don't even know it. It's alien to you. If you are in the category who needs to give your heart to Jesus, I want you to come out. But for those of you who are already born again, but you are making it right with God, place your hands on your chest. We don't have time. So I'm dealing with these two categories. If you have not said, Jesus, become the Lord of my life. I told you, only God anoints men. Jesus, the Son of God. You want to come out? Come quickly. I don't want to mix it up. 
I see a lot of people already with their hands on their chest. Praise God. Everybody is born again. Now go ahead and tell the Lord to help you. Tell the Lord to help you. Tell the Lord to help you. Hear this. I want to tell the Lord to touch at least seven people at a sign. And then I'll call our Father, Bishop will be to come and pray over us and release a heavenly, a fatherly blessing. But you have asked for mercy and God is about to touch people. I will lay hands on these ones, but it's a sign that God has said our prayers and God will anoint people from this conference. I don't want you to be very rowdy, but right now, Holy Spirit, the men you are prepared tonight to touch, the ones you want to pour a fresh oil on, the ones that are earmarked as a first fruit of this operation, whether they are here on ground or online, I speak now, let the hand of God come upon them mightily. Seven of them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, take! Ushers, bring them quickly. Hear me? Somebody has a growth in the body that is being dematerialized now. There's a growth around your breast. It's been, it's melting now. You can check your body. You discover the growth is gone. Check now. There is a growth that is dematerializing now. I just picked it in my spirit. Please, anybody finds out that something that looks like a lump has melted. Can you wave at me? Please check your body. I just picked that now. I have not prayed. But I guess that was a problem in your heart that God wants to address. It's like a pain, a painful substance or something in somebody's. You have, hey, help the sister. She just lifted her hands and the power of God is on her. Bring her here. Bring her here, please. At this point, just bring her towards the front. She just lifted her hands and the power of God took her down. You would help us come and Please hear this. It's not difficult for God to anoint a man. But there are postures you take to be able to receive the anointing. And so the things I taught you tonight are postures of the spirit that are made for the receipt of the anointing. Number one is the posture of honor. Number two is the posture of yieldedness. And number three is the posture of service or body. You don't have these three postures, forget it. The anointing is not for you. And so for you to manifest, you have to build up. Build up in prayer. Because there is a place you pray to where there are coals of fire. That's where your tongue will be touched. And if your tongue is taught, it will be poured. When you come back, you can become a prophet. <laughs>